Hi, everyone. <coughs> it's Nicola Burton from the Music Means Business team. And I have got Manny and Michael from the Pushworth team with me, but a couple of very special guests today. We've got John Kenny and Lindsay Mangle from Kenny & Co. Now, a lot of you will know that um, John is one of the foremost authorities on trademarks for the music industry in Australia. Uh, his vast career has uh, gone through the explosion of music history in Australia through what the 70s, 80s, 90s um, and the, the, um, the 2000s and he is the guy, he's the go-to guy when you want to know about um, everything towards about digital distribution and, and digital rights and trademarking your music brand. So we are very, very fortunate to have him and Lindsay with us today. Hi John, hi Lindsay, how are you? Great. They're great. I'm great. Now, John, you're in Nor Norfolk Island right now. What's it like in isolation over in Norfolk Island? Uh, well, uh, the island is only 1,800 people. And when we don't have isolation, we have tourists, which keep the island alive. Yeah. We have no tourists at the moment. So the last time we didn't have tourists was about 1955. So it's eerily quiet and... Um, and we go to the beach and there's no one there. And so it's, 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 it's uh, unnatural not to have people visit us. Yeah, it would be surreal. It would be surreal. It well, it's, surreal. So, it's so strange over here. Um, when we first started this, it was like one of those, um, you know, B-grade Hollywood movies where, you know, a bomb's gone off. There was nothing happening. But now, for the last week, it's like everything's almost back to normal in Brisbane. It's, it's very strange. But they st you're still in lockdown in Brisbane, aren't you? We're still in lockdown. Pubs and clubs are still closed. So there are no music, no live music shows in Queensland. Um, we hear that Northern Territory goes back, I think, next week with um, pubs and clubs. So fingers crossed Queensland will soon follow. So everything's crossed for that. So I think, I think the fact is that uh, our Commonwealth Government has done some remarkably progressive and uh, adventurous funding deals, but completely missed the bus when it comes to the creative sector. Yes, yes, there's a lot of consternation and we've learned a lot of lessons from this. And um, part of the reason why we're doing the music reel is to talk to the artists about their music business, to use this time to upgrade their practices, maybe look at, um, I suppose, the, the kind of financial entities that they're using for their businesses so that when something like this happens, they don't fall with, between the cracks. Uh, try and get their businesses up and running in a different way to try and, I guess, future-proof a little bit, if, 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 you, if that's a word we could use. So the reason why we wanted to talk to you today was about trademarking because a lot of artists um, are out there building their brands, but they are not trademarked, which makes them quite vulnerable. So I was wondering if you could give us a little chat about that. Sure. I think the difficulty with trademarks is that the music industry has a culture of auto automatic benefits. Because it's a copyright-driven industry and copyrights are allocated automatically without registration and without the need to apply, the music industry gets lulled into a sense of security that, um, that they get their, their brands for free because they conceive their brand that they own their brand. Um, it should go it should go quietly at the moment, but there are major Australian artists who are doing very well around the world who just still haven't worked out that trademarks are critical. So if we're looking at the assets that a musician uh, acquires by performing his or her creative functions, firstly, uh, they develop uh, copyrights in music and sound, and the good folk at APRA and AMCOS uh, our world's best practice in administering the copyrights that the music industry generates automatically. So I think this sense of big brother will help you out concept is, is infused into the industry and the, and the sense of having to register trademarks and apply for them um, is, is a, a step just a little beyond the comfort zone and understanding of most artists. But the truth is, unless you register your, your performing name, even your personal name, you don't own it. So luckily, uh, Lindsay and I do the work for John Butler. John Butler is Australia's canniest independent artist uh, under the stable of Sebastian Chase. And, uh, and there he's marvellous label Jarrah Records. And uh, uh, all of that's been trademarked. 
So the issue about trademarks is to own your name, you have to be the first to use it, the first to register it, and you have to formally apply. And then when you get accepted, as you inevitably will, uh, uh, it's like it, it, then you own it and you can transact and negotiate with it. But until you do that, what you own is the reputation as opposed to the word. So back in the day, uh, Manny's favourite band from the 60s was the Deltones. Um, the Deltones had somebody break away from them and set up another band called the Delis. So can you believe it? There's the Deltones working their tail off in the 80s. One of their singers goes away and forms the Delis. Uh, that would be like uh, Jimmy Barnes leaving Cold Chisel and forming a band called Chisel, as if wow. the industry didn't they would automatically... You know, allocate shortened nicknames to bands. So we had to have a very expensive court case to slap the uh, the the the, uh, uh, the, the, the the departing singer to get our name back. And we had to do that without a trademark. The benefit of a trademark is that it allocates ownership, and it and it gives a shortcut to the enforceability of the name when you go to court. So. If you go to court with a trademark, you get automatic hearing within three or five, three to five weeks, maybe wow. shorter. Um, whereas if you do a, a, the parts, what the, the element of relying on the goodwill and the, 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 the reputation, that can take 18 months and about 10 times the fees. Wow. So it's a bit of a well-kept secret. I mean, on that, uh, about eight years ago, I gave a paper for... Uh, Q music, and we looked at the artists that have their have their trademarks and those that don't. So you'd be interested to see those lists in that paper I sent you. But yes. it, it, all the yes. time, there's an issue for artists who are emerging to get their name registered, and not just in Australia, because we have digital worldwide coverage. Musicians need to register their brands around the world. So a registration in Australia, unlike copyright is not a registration in America. So a lot of bands have had to change their name and they've run into that. So uh, Nicola's favourite band from the 80s was Flowers. Uh, but when it went to America, there was a metal band called Flowers, so they became Ice House. It, it, the Angels had the same problem. So you need a trademark, you need it early, and you need it in the territories where you want to do business, which for most musicians now is worldwide. And I think that's a great explanation for everyone because Michael is in the middle of his original project, how much money, energy and effort you've put into that so that someone could leave and call themselves Envy or Venus and all of that work that you've done, if you haven't actually trademarked, um, it's kind of not worth it. So um, all of you yeah. artists out there, my goodness, if you're really, really serious, especially now that there's going to be more business digitally online, you really need to protect yourself with getting a trademark. Um, yeah, That's so it. important. I think Manny's got a couple of Unfortunately, questions. yeah, the, unfortunately, the, there's just this resistance. I mean, God bless them. They're wonderful people. But it, it's still not folklore. Um, some bands get, get the message and immediately act on it. Powderfinger, when I was doing work for them, they instantly got it and instantly registered it. Yeah. Uh, other bands have some resistance to doing it. I mean, there's some heritage acts. Heritage acts are the ones that desperately need it. Doc yep. Neeson, funded by a major industrialist in Sydney, and the rest of the Angels attended Doc's funeral, still in court cases about who owned the name The Angel. Yeah. So it is an indignity and a massive oversight to launch a business without a trade, launch a creative uh career without a trademark or a series of trademarks because no nothing can really stop anyone else from registering say um um let's say i'll pull a name out, party band a and you've spent 40 years building that brand there's nothing to stop somebody else from setting up a website in that name or selling t-shirts in that name if you don't right. have it trademarked <laughs> bloody hell sadly i i I've got to be careful about mentioning names but yeah. there was a major independent label of a major independent artist in Australia who had a huge run in the 90s, should go silently on the name, but at, at one stage he allowed his domain names to lapse and uh, uh, 
a, a Swedish uh, snuff porn promoter decided to claim his brand. And so when you go to his label brand now, you meet the most perverse uh, uh, stream of pornography. He right. still hasn't reclaimed his brand because he's so intimidated by the processes of having to get it back again. So, guys, the website, and we're only, we're only 50 miles from a major precinct of hackers that work on the Gold Coast, um, you know, influenced by a whole bunch of other social creatures, you wouldn't go into cyberspace without a trademark. No. I was privileged to even register Skyhooks' as brand 35 years after the band broke up. They went through their whole run, international deals, blah, 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 no trademark, right at the end where there's only, you know, re-releases -re -re and, and website memory groups from fans. They finally claimed their name, the, the, the Skyhook. So if you're in the business of music, you are promoting a brand and you need to have a trademark. Yeah, good advice. I think Manny's got a pertinent question to ask you. I guess going back, there's a couple of questions that I have. You know, first and foremost is obviously we're moving back in like it's deja vu and Groundhog Day. 25 to 30 years ago, we were managing artists. We were, you know, complicit in the recording process, trademarking, et cetera, et cetera. Revisit 25 to 30 years later, never say never. We said we'd never manage bands again, um, but we're managing bands again. So we're managing an array of younger bands and we're encouraging them to actually trademark for the reasons you've just, uh, you know, like you've Absolutely. mentioned. The issue becomes, yep. what I'm finding with younger bands is, until they're touched by that poison stick of somebody coming in and commandeering some of their, their rights, so, so to speak, they look at that investment and say to themselves, well, do we really need it now? Because it's, it's like any other business. You've been, you're building a mercantile, you know, sort of um, you know, outcome, you're trying to build something that's viable and then they look at it as an expense and say to themselves, well, well sometime in the future we'll find it. I just need, you know, it, it's hard, but without putting actual finite figure on it, can we get a ballpark figure of what it physically costs to actually trademark, let's say on a global basis, well, you know, well, let's say let's do Australia, let's do New Zealand, let's do America, and like let's do Europe. Let's say a young band starting to break in Australia. We, so we're now going to break them in those other global territories. What we in a roundabout way, what would that cost? There's, there's two ways to look at that. There's uh, I'll hand over to Lindsay in a minute. But the first way is that you do it yourself. The second way is you get some help with it. It's not particularly hard to do trademarks. Um, if you're a major artist with a deal and you've got gigs lined up and you've got a bit of budget, well, Lindsay will tell you what it takes for a lawyer to do it. One of the reasons that lawyers do it is that you often have to get into a conversation with the trademarks office and musicians don't do, you know, deadlines and responses to requisitions and all that rubbish well. They're doing other more important things. So if you've, if you've got an enterprise which is cranking, the budgets of doing this work are relatively modest. But if you're at Groundhog Day and there's nothing, there's, you know, we really haven't got any money, you, what you do is you pull up um, the trademarks office, register, and you look at John Butler and see the four trademarks that John Butler's got, and you could pretty much replicate those. So, Trademarks are on a public register and you can see what other artists have done. If you go to Robbie Williams's name, you'll see 15 trademarks, which is probably a little over the top. Uh, if you go to John Butler's name, you see four because he releases his own records on his own label and does a whole bunch of things. But for an artist, you know, there's only a few classes that you need to go in and you, you could probably wing it. I mean, I, I have a sense... Uh, and Nicola and Manny can comment on this. Uh, I think the musicians, the, the, the artists that I deal with less frequently in my old age, but you know, having dealt with 70s pop stars and then dealt with the new millennial or pop star, they're far more attuned, they're far more switched on, they're, they're, they're far more aware of 
uh, of what they have to do, and especially digitally. So kids are smart enough to do their own trademarking. And that's, that's just for the out-of-pocket expenses. If you want to make sure that you're getting it right and your specifications right and all that, you know, blah, blah, outsource it. Because you, you might necessarily, but if you've got lots of time between gigs and songwriting, you could stay at that screen and kind of work it out yourself by going to the trademark register, bringing up other major artists and using the, 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 the principles that they use. But just to give you the idea of the out-of-pocket, and the out idea, the out of pocket expenses that the government charge, and what we would charge. Um, Lindsay Mengel, who does all this for us, will will give you an idea now. Uh, I just add to add to that. I, I wouldn't put uh, any less emphasis on doing up your specification and choosing your classes because, um, yeah, you know, the the simple one is to run with uh, something like John Butler has, but. You know that may not completely align with what you want to do, and you will be either wasting money or um, not getting an, enough uh, classes or the scope of classes which you want to adequately look after yourself. But um, John's right; it is very simple at the outset. It's to lodge a basic one by yourself. You know, lodge a basic one by yourself, and then come back and talk to you know John and I or somebody else at a later date to add a few other classes to it and tidy up your original ones, just get that original application in um, at very least. Yeah, um, I'll put um, your contact details in um, yeah. in the, the body of this, um, this post because I really want people to stay in touch with John and Lindsay uh, because the amount of time and money that you invest in this, it's not worth it to do it. You're, like really, if you're serious about it and you're protecting your investment, talk to these guys before you do anything, I would really recommend. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so, Time is, we've, we've only got time for one more question. So I'm going to actually send it to Michael. What, when you're, you're actually um, embarking on, I think it was your third single release, what, what kind of information do you think would help you with regard to trademarking? Uh, look, I, I, I think just sitting in the discussion, listening to it today has, has highlighted a, a whole bunch of points uh, for me that obviously going to make me go away and actually do it. Um, I think I think the the main thing is is you know just making sure how do how do you sort of assure that you've got all covered all bases covered when you when you're registering? Lindsay, yeah, Lindsay, just talk about the applicant issue and the classes issue. Yeah. All right. So uh, you've got uh, two things to look at, and um, the second point with the classes relates to pricing as well. Um, it's tied back to Manny's question. So the applicant is important, determining who actually owns the trademark and who should be making the application in the first instance can be uh, life-threatening to the brand, uh, to the registration. Uh, if you get that wrong, then there's you know, problems up the yin-yang, which John and I have nightmares over, which is just mm. stressful. Um, so choosing and identifying the right place and the right applicants for a brand is imperative. Uh, the second one sitting there is um, is the classes and choosing the right classes to make your application. So trademarks work and the costings work on the number of classes you choose. So you know one class is three hundred thirty bucks with the government. Um, you know plus any professionals if you're dealing with a professional, um, and it just adds up from there. Three thirty, six sixty, nine ninety. But you need to choose the right classes. So a musician would be looking at a, at a couple of classes. Uh, again, look at John Butler, but nine and 41 as the most basic ones. Nine for digital distribution of a product, a uh, good, and then uh, class 41 for entertainment services. But then you've got other ones like clothing on the 25 or uh, posters and whatnot on the 16. Or you might want to sell, you know, you might be doing beers or wine or something. That's a separate one as well. So... It's looking at the applicant and then the classes which you want. Uh, they're the two main main things to be looking at. That's All great. Right. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Lindsay. I think you've given us a lot to think about, guys. Um, I'll put all the information on our website because I highly recommend that you contact John and Lindsay. It's a, a critical aspect of your music business. I'm going to leave it there with everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in with us again. And I'll talk to John and Lindsay. Thank you so much for coming on. We'll talk to you again very soon. Thank you. See you guys.